Dear friends of the European Academy of Art, Science and Art, it's a particular privilege for me giving a talk about my old friend, Paul Crutzen, about Anthropocene and climate crisis. The state of the planet is broken, says the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres. Um, he also says that other than with COVID-19, there is no vaccination available, you know. And we experience a relentless increase of global warming. The former World Bank economist, Herman Daly, who is also professor now emeritus uh, in America, proposes to distinguish the empty world from the full world. The empty world was earlier times, and the full world is now. And the empty world was sustainable. And the full world is not. It's hardly sustainable. At a meeting in 2000 of the Scientific Committee of the IGBP, the International Geosphere Biosphere Program, happening in Cuernavaca in Mexico, scientists were talking about the Holocene, the very benign geological epoch of the past 11,000 years after the last ice age. They described the massive changes occurring on Earth since a couple of decades and centuries, meaning during the full world. Paul Crutzen sat in the room listening, but with increasing exasperation. And suddenly he raised his voice and said, we are no longer in the benign Holocene, but in, uh, and then he didn't know what to say and said, in the Anthropocene. So he sat of, in talking, invented the term. Later, Paul Crutzen learned that Eugene Sturmer, a freshwater biologist in America, had used the term Anthropocene some years earlier although with a somewhat different, much narrower meaning. Crutzen invited Sturmer to co-publish the term and the concept. And that was the beginning of a most fabulous linguistic career of the term Anthropocene almost immediately. And the IGBP community quickly adopted the term as a central framing concept for much of their work. This story I was learning from a very, very kind obituary note praising Paul Crutzen after his death by Jan Zalasiewicz, by Jan Zalasiewicz, Colin Waters and Will Steffen, Will Steffen from Australia. The full world is now called the Anthropocene. And it saw 70 years, essentially since 1950, of explosive acceleration. This picture is a colored version of a paper published by Will Stephens the professor whom I just mentioned, Paul Crutzen and John McNeil. You may see a thin vertical line on each of these small pictures. This is the year 1950, meaning that after 1950, the explosion began with world population, uh, world GDP, etc., etc. And then the green pictures show the suffering of nature. The higher the curve, the more disastrous for the environment. 
But the core fact of the full world is world population increase. Since 1950, we had roughly a tripling of world population. And also a 20 fold increase of human consumption. The United Nations Fund for Population Activities in 2015 published a paper called Consequential Omissions in which they show that areas of the world with high population increase were the economic losers and those capable of stabilize, stabil, stabilizing rising the world uh, their population in particular east asia were the big winners one measure of the anthropocene is particularly alarming it's the body weights of land living vertebrates and it was calculated that roughly two thirds of the body weights is essentially animals for slaughter by humans and 30% humans, leaving a mere 3% of the global body weights of wild animals, 3%. That's an indication that our present Anthropocene situation is totally unsustainable. The current trends in the full world are in no way sustainable. Most alarming evidently is global warming and the biodiversity collapse. Back to climate policy. In Sweden in 2018, we saw 28 large wildfires. And these Swedish shocks triggered and boosted Greta Thunberg's huge resonance. A schoolgirl of 50 years sat before the Reichstag and uh, protested and said, we have to go in strike. Most of the global heating that we are currently experiencing is on land, I mean, wildfires and all that stuff. But the real heating occurs in the oceans. The blue part shows the ocean heating and the red part is land and atmosphere heating, meaning that the real scam may soon be the rise of the seawater table. Look for an illustration at this. Italy during the last ice age was a lot larger and the Adriatic Sea was, a much, was much smaller. And during the last hot age, roughly 2 million years ago, Italy was only half the size. And imagine what that means for places like London, Stockholm, Athens, or Florida, or Bangladesh for that matter. Some 1.3 billion people, of them 0.8 billion in Asia alone, live directly at the ocean coasts. The red dots mean cities of more than a million people. And some of them evidently like Shanghai or Mumbai or so, um, more than 10 mil million people. So imagine the seawater table rising by something like five meters and we would have 200 million additional refugees. Of course, we at the Club of Rome and anyway, people were happy about the Paris Climate Agreement. But how do countries respond to it? The typical first reaction worldwide is, well, yes, okay, let's do something on climate, but it's going to be very expensive. So we need a lot more economic growth. Is that the right answer? I suggest it is not. It's a mad answer. I mean, here on these small pictures, we see the most important eight economic sectors in which from left to right, 
we plot the per capita um, GDP. And from bottom to top, we plot the carbon dioxide emissions per person. And they go absolutely hand in hand in each of the eight sectors. Meaning that if we just do more economic growth, we will automatically have more carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, we are reasonably good doctors in the meantime for diagnosis. We know that global warming is a toxic disease, but we are totally mad doctors for recovery. We systematically suggest treatments that make the disease worse. Would you go to such doctors if you are ill? Well, one of the problems is we people. People seem to prefer reassuring lies over the inconvenient truth. This picture was made by the um, cartoonist uh, after Al Gore in America, then vice president, had published his book, An Inconvenient Truth, and made a film out of that, An Inconvenient Truth. And the cartoonist uh, imagined a cinema in which the inconvenient truth is shown and a reassuring lie. And where are people going? They love the reassuring lie. I mean, Donald Trump knew that very well. While we he sit here comfortably, some 600 new coal power plants are under construction or planned worldwide. And evidently 90% of them in developing countries. We shouldn't blame them for that because we have shown them uh, how Europe got uh, rich. But an effective climate policy must include the developing countries. In the current negotiations at the conferences of the parties of the climate convention, typically the developing countries say, well, uh, stopping global warming is your task, not ours. We have to grow. And if we don't include the developing countries, we are losing the war. I believe the best and most promising strategy is the so-called budget approach, in which it was said that all countries will receive identical per capita permits for using the atmosphere, meaning emitting uh, greenhouse gases. But the old industrialized countries, that's the red lines, have almost already exhausted their carbon budget and would then have to go shopping to developing countries, the green lines, for new permits. That would mean all of a sudden, overnight, the developing countries would become richer by entering the game of uh, reducing and stopping global warming. Today, the opposite is true. They get richer by doing the wrong thing. And if we do that, the budget approach, then the Indian economy minister, one of the most aggressive friends of new coal power plants, would soon switch from promoting coal power to renewables and energy efficiency while selling the thereby freed respective permits to the north. Now, we have roughly three different options for the decarbonization. 30% is just less carbon dioxide in energy. That's what everybody knows, and it's a standard recipe. But I believe less energy in well-being is the larger and most important option. But nobody can believe that. And then less consumption. Well, that's extremely unpopular. So I know no government in the world that is seriously 
proposing that as the main answer to the global warming uh, uh, problems. For the Club of Rome, I had the privilege of writing a book, Factor 5, together with an Australian team under Charlie Hargroves, who is now also a member of the Club of Rome, in which we demonstrate that for the four most important, most relevant sectors of the economy, a five-fold increase of energy productivity and also raw materials productivity is available. And that would allow us to completely stop fossil fuel burning and of course, nuclear power as well. Factor five shows technically, the Australians did most of that, uh, it's feasible. Then there are of course, two more options, stabilize and uh, later reduce human world population, very important. And a new point, geoengineering. Here again, Paul Crutzen comes in. He proposed officially to have aerosols uh, boosted into the stratosphere in order to shield away heating uh, sunlight. And then there are many other options. I had the privilege in Santa Barbara, California, where I was serving as the Dean of the Californian School of Environmental Science and Management to invite Paul Crutzen, who typically had his winter months in San Diego, California. And he was generous enough accepting the invitation. And we had a wonderful chance of speaking with each other about all the necessary political stops um, for curbing global warming. And he explained to me that he had proposed the ge geoengineering option in order to shock the public so that they would learn there are much more benign options available than geoengineering. And aside, he greatly encouraged me to pursue the Factor 5 strategy, which was in the writing at the time, which he found more thrilling than decarbonizing the use of energy. Let me at the end offer some thoughts by the Club of Rome. We published a major new report called Come On. I mean, Come On has two different meanings in the English language, consisting of three parts. Part one, Come On. Don't tell me the current trends are sustainable. They are not. Part two, come on, don't stick to outdated philosophies. And part three, come on, join us on an exciting journey towards a sustainable world. Part two says that our civilizations are in a deep philosophical crisis. And we find almost exactly the same concern in Pope Francis' fabulous encyclical Laudato Si, where he declares that the current philosophy of greed, relentless competition and wild acceleration is destroying our common home. Responding to the philosophical crisis, we suggest to engage in a new enlightenment. A year and a half ago, I had the privilege of addressing the first All European Fridays for Future meeting that was in Lausanne, Switzerland, meeting there with Greta Thunberg. And we also chatted about the new philosophy, a philosophy amenable for the young and for the next generation, for the future. But coming back to command for a moment, we must realize that we have no time to wait for philosophical results of the new enlightenment, we also have to act now. And that is part three of the book, as I said, uh, come on and join us, etc. And that is also about policy change. We need absolutely massive changes in agriculture, energy, transport, circular economy, financial markets, they have to be controlled, and tax systems making 
the climate-friendly operations more profitable than the climate-destroying operations, which is the case now. This is the end of my homage to my deceased uh, friend, Paul Crutzen. Thank you very much.